Christy Yamaguchi is that when she was very young, in her first competition, she finished something like 12th, right? To her mom, Carol Yamaguchi, she said, how come the other girls, these three girls got ribbons and I got nothing? And her mom said, that's because you finished 12th, honey. If you want a ribbon, you got to finish first, second, or third. And she tells that story. And so Christy Yamaguchi, she started practicing and she went to practice every day at I don't know, six in the morning. And she, you know, she had to have a flexible school program because she was practicing so much. And so no, nobody in my book became instantly remarkable and instantly made a difference. You need to sacrifice. It, it just comes with the territory. And I think you ask, how do you stay motivated? Well, I think much of that answer is that when you find what you love, you don't even think about what motivates you. It's like, you know, honestly, it's not like I sit around saying, what motivates me to write? How can I keep getting motivated? What keeps, you know, what keeps me podcasting? Now, don't get me wrong. There are moments where I say, Oh man, this is too hard. I got to give this up. So everybody has those moments of doubt. And if anybody tells you that they never had a moment of doubt, that they never grew frustrated or tired, I'm telling you right now, they are lying to you. They're lying to you for sure. They may also be lying to themselves. It's just not possible. Everybody has these moments of doubt. So the test is not whether you have these moments of doubt. The test is whether you can push through them and keep going. That's where you get remarkable or not. Guy, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, absolutely delighted to have you uh, as our guest today. Oh, I listen. You know, you we, well in the before we pressed the record button, we were discussing okay. my love of Istanbul. So, and you know, I gotta come back for one thing. I need to see the Apple Store because I hear that's one of the coolest Apple stores in the world. You know, the one of my closest friends at Apple, uh, he now manages the store that's right near the Apple campus in Cupertino, which it's got to be the worst job in the world because all the Apple execs probably come there. But anyway, so he's Turkish. <laughs> so he went to Istanbul to help open up that store. Uh, we will be excited to host you back. Probably you have been a couple of times in Istanbul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My first question is about barbecue and surfing. So uh, <laughs> could you share us with any stories about your barbecue experiences that you might not have mentioned Dr. Jane Goodall? <laughs> yeah, well, well, people might not understand the context. So Jane Goodall is all about uh, protecting animals and cruelty to animals and stuff like that. So, you know, you, you probably shouldn't tell Jane Goodall that you like steaks. Uh, <laughs> that might not go over too well. And in fact, I'll tell you a funny story. So once I was going to be the host of a online appearance of her grandson. Okay. So her grandson and I, I was the host, he was the guest. And it was, it was like this, you know, with the show, the, the room behind my, my background is a real background. It's not a virtual background. Okay. And just as we're going on, I figured out, oh my God, I have my cowboy boots on the shelf and it's ostrich. So I'm thinking, oh man, Jane Goodall's grandson is going to look at my ostrich boots and he's going to freak out and like to rush and take the boots out of the picture. So, so I love barbecue. I have to tell you, although like a month ago, I had a, a laboratory blood test and they said, you know, you have high levels of cholesterol. So there goes the barbecue. I guess I can eat barbecue chicken. But, uh, uh, some of the listeners may not know about your background. So what core business skills did you acquire from starting in sales roles? How, <laughs> how do these skills translate to other functions? Because you are not a technical guy. No, I'm not a technical guy. So uh, I went to Stanford and after Stanford, I entered law school and I lasted two weeks in law school and I quit. I couldn't handle law school. And the following year, I started an MBA program. And when I was in the MBA program, I went to work for a Los Angeles jewelry manufacturer, just counting diamonds and stuff. And after I graduated my MBA, I went to work for that LA manufacturer. 
as opposed to all my friends who are going to investment banks and consulting firms and all that kind of stuff. And I was in the jewelry business in sales and marketing and the jewelry business is hand to hand combat. I mean, it's, it's kind of like going into the grand bazaar and trying to negotiate, you know, or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they say it's a hundred and no, I pay 10. <laughs> and uh, so I learned how to sell. And then after that, I became Apple's second software evangelist. My job was to convince people to create Macintosh products. And I started a few high tech companies, became a writer and a speaker. I returned to Apple as Apple's chief evangelist. I left that. Started some more companies, and now I'm chief evangelist of Canva, which is an online graphics design service, and I'm host of the Remarkable People podcast, and that's it. That's what I do. <laughs> I podcast, and I help Canva, and I surf. Uh, you have written 16 books now, also uh, <laughs> Think Remarkable. How did you start writing, and what led you to write the first book, The Macintosh yeah. Way? So the first book was in 1987. And at the time, I was CEO of a small startup. And it's a long story, but I just wasn't happy in that job. And so I wrote a book called The Macintosh Way, which was cathartic in the sense that I wrote a book about how I thought businesses should run, not, not that I was doing it, but how I thought it would run, should run, based on my experience in Macintosh, in the Macintosh division. So that was my first book. And at the time when I finished that book, I said, you know, this is it. You got nothing else to talk about. So I've told myself 15 times that this is your last book. And now I guess I'm going to tell myself the 16th time, this is my last book. Although I'm running out of time, I'm 69 years old. So uh, at some point it's going to be true. It's my last book. And my journey with writing is that I find it, it, I'm fundamentally a marketing person. So as a marketing person, what happens is you take whatever engineers throw over the wall and it's your job to sell it, right? But you have very little input into what the product is, how it's engineered. And for me, writing is, is when I'm an engineer because if I decide to add a feature to a book, I don't have to ask some engineer to do it with a compiler. I just do it, right? So Microsoft Word is my compiler. So this is as close as I've ever gotten to becoming the creator of something as opposed to the marketer of something. And I think that's fundamentally my love of writing that I'm in total control. Can you tell us about the Apple's Think Different campaign? Also, the book name is Think Remarkable. How did you name the book? So in 1997, this is when Apple was, you know, at its low point. Uh, Apple started an ad campaign called Think Different. And it featured people like Amelia Earhart, Gandhi, Einstein, Richard Branson. And these were the leaders and the innovators. And the message was, if you want to be like them, you need to think different. Because thinking different back then was required to use a Macintosh. If you were thinking the same, you would be using Windows. So the whole pitch was, if you want to stand out, if you want to be different, you want to be innovative and creative, use a Macintosh. If you want to just be part of the great unwashed masses, use Windows. So that, that was the genesis of that campaign. And I, I now think that, oh, listen, lots of good stuff has happened since 1997, but also lots of bad stuff has happened. And, you know, the world is probably more fractured and more dangerous than ever. And so I think we have to go beyond thinking different to thinking remarkable because, yeah, technically you could think different. I think Donald Trump thinks different. I don't think he thinks remarkable. There's a big difference, right? So we need to go to the next stage of thinking remarkable. I would like to add another, um, your experiences with Steve Jobs and uh, think, think, I mean, you have in the book, uh, especially with the campaign, it must have been a daunting to have disagreement with the Steve Jobs. How did you feel when he expressed distrust towards you? So uh, to bring your listeners up to speed, uh, when the Think Different ad campaign was brought to Apple, I was in the room with 10 other people and Steve Jobs. And at the end of the presentation, and we all love the TV commercials, uh, the Lee Clow from Chayette, the ad agency, says to Steve, I got two copies of these ads. I'll give one to you and one to Guy. And Steve says, don't give one to Guy. Just give me both. I said, now this is in front of everybody. I said, what's the matter, Steve? Don't you trust me? And then Steve said, yes, I don't trust you. 
And then this is now a man or mouse moment, right? Like this is the kind of time you look back and you say, I either I seized the day and I stood up or you say, shit, I wimped out. I like, you know, what was I thinking? Why did I back down? And I was determined not to have those kind of thoughts. So he said, that's right, guy, I don't trust you. And I came right back and I said, that's okay, Steve, I don't trust you either. So that probably cost me a few million in stock options. <laughs> but I get to tell that great story. That's worth a few million. And also, there are quote unquote asshole leaders. In what <laughs> way was Steve Jobs uh, and I mean, good way or a bad way, asshole leader? Yeah, well, so, you know, there's a couple parameters at which you have to look at leaders. And there's, you know, these are kind, supportive, kind of perfect AR, HR kind of leaders, right? And then there's Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs ruled by fear and intimidation. And, you know, he had very high standards. And literally, I was afraid of being ripped to shreds by him in public. And, you know, this is contrary to most people's theory of management, but I got to tell you, it was extremely motivating. And one of the things I learned and I wrote about in the book is as you look back and maybe it's 20 years later, but as you look back, the bosses and the coaches and the teachers who were the hardest on you are the ones you learn the most from, not the ones that let you get away with stuff. So... I feel like it was a privilege and an honor to work for Steve, although I still have PTSD. But but the dichotomy we're trying to make is, you know, there's asshole, non-asshole leaders, but there's also brilliant and non-brilliant leaders. And so that's a two by two matrix. And most people are not brilliant and assholes. Steve is the brilliant asshole. And so, you know, getting the asshole part is easy. Anybody can do that. It's the brilliant part that's hard. So people should focus on being the brilliant visionary leader. And then uh, ideally you wouldn't be an asshole, but it's better to have an asshole mission-driven leader than to have an asshole incompetent leader and even a kind incompetent leader. How did yeah. you start surfing at age of 60? Uh, you grew up in uh, uh, Hawaii, surrounded by iconic surf culture. Yeah. What took you so long to give a <laughs> surfing a try? Well, you know, I, I start off the book with a discussion of the growth mindset. And the growth mindset means that you don't think your capabilities and your interests are limited. Like if you have a fixed mindset, you think this is how I'm born. These are my talents. These are my weaknesses. I can't change them. I can't improve. I can't deteriorate, can't get new stuff. Now, if you have a growth mindset, you believe that, you know, you're a flexible, programmable, improvable person. I, I have to say that perhaps when I was young, I had too much of a fixed mindset that I thought I was, you know, good in academics and good in football or something. But I didn't want to venture into surfing because surfing was... I'd never done it. I would suck at it. You know, it would take a while. So I didn't want to risk my self-image of competence. And then 60 years later, I finally embraced the growth mindset. And my daughter took up surfing in a big way. So I decided to take up surfing so I could surf with her. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's many surfers in, in Turkey, but uh, taking up surfing at 60, is a very, very difficult thing. Uh, it's about 55 years too late. So, but I persevered. In a sense, my surfing career is a microcosm of the book because it takes, there's three stages in my book, growth, grit, and grace. So growth is taking up a new sport. Grit is just putting in the effort for years to achieve competency. And then grace, which I have not yet reached yeah. in surfing, <laughs> is when you want to you know, pay back society and help others and all that. I'm not there in surfing. I'm there in other things, but not surfing. So I also read the Carol, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. So uh, as a father, how it changed your mindset? Uh, did it change your uh, perspective for your son and daughter? Yeah, so... You know, when you're raising kids, I think the fixed mindset parent would say, you know, son or daughter, you have a gift for this and you don't have a gift for that. So just stick with this. Uh, a, a growth mindset parent would say, listen, try a lot of different things. 
you're going to succeed sometimes, you're going to fail sometimes, but you know, the journey is the reward. And listen, if you, if you take up, if you take up surfing, it's not because you expect to be the next Kelly Slater or the next world champion surfer. It's because it's a beautiful thing that you can use the rest of your life. So yeah, you're going to suck for the first year, but that's okay. And after you achieve a certain level of ability, if it no longer interests you, then, you know, I don't care, take a yeah, violin, take a whatever you want to take, take up. And I think that is it's a very healthy a attitude for a parent. And also the, the recent work of Carol Dweck, and she's working with another professor named Mary Murphy. And so, you know, it, it was like for, for the last couple of decades, we're all been thinking growth mindset, growth mindset. It's what's in your head, right? And what Mary Murphy adds to this whole discussion is that it's not just what's in your head, it's also your environment. Because if you have a growth yeah. mindset in a fixed mindset environment, you are going to be bludgeoned to death. I mean, you won't succeed, or at least you won't get as far as you could. So in a perfect case, you have a growth mindset in a growth organization. So this organization means that you don't think that, oh, people are just rock stars and they're, you know, they went to Ivy League schools and they're just at the pinnacle and, you know, this is like all the best of the best because that's a fixed mindset. And it means that, you know, if you're not from an Ivy League school in America, if you're not tall, white and male, then you cannot be good. And so if you have a growth mindset in that kind of organization, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to succeed. So parents need to create not only the growth mindset in their kids, but there needs to be a growth mindset in the family, the environment that the kids grow up in. What new skills are you trying to learn after surfing? Do you also continue to learn new things? <laughs> well, listen, my, my pattern in sports has been to take up sports that my kids take up. So at 44, I took up ice hockey. Is there an ice hockey rink in Turkey? Yes, we have. Uh, oh, okay. In... okay. So at 44, I took up ice hockey because my two sons are taking up ice hockey. And so all I did was play hockey for 16 years. I loved hockey. And then I discovered surfing and I like surfing more than hockey. Surfing is harder than hockey. So if all you hockey players in Turkey are saying, ah, oh, you know, hockey is so hard. I'm so talented. You, you, want some, you want some humiliation? I dare you to take up surfing. I'm telling you, surfing is harder. So the pattern of my life has been take up whatever my kids take up. Now, one of my kids is a wingsuiter, right? So wingsuiters where you, you put that thing on, you jump out of airplanes and you look like a flying squirrel. I think that's where I draw the line. I am not taking that up. I mean, that's, okay. my growth mindset stops there because I want to look good when I'm dead. Should you explain what is the difference between interest and passion? Yeah, so this is the very important distinction that I think many people get so wrong and it's very destructive. There, there seems to be this line of thinking that you need to find your passion in life. And often the pressure starts from high school, right? And it culminates in America anyway, at like 18 years old, when you're filling out your college applications and there's always an essay about, you know, tell us about yourself or what's your passion in life. And it's, it's kind of like they're saying, what, you're 18 years old. You haven't discovered your passion yet. You haven't started a foundation. You haven't built the school in Africa or South America. You know, what's wrong with you? You're a failure. It's 18. You should have discovered your passion already. And so I think we do a great disservice to people when we force them to try the big word P, passion in their life. Because to find your passion in life, you need to do a lot of sampling, sampling that occurs for the rest of your life. So I think a better word to look for is interest. So you may be interested in surfing or interested in hockey or interested in violin or interested in photography or interested in movie making or interested in poetry. And so you scratch all these scratch interests all and knock on wood, knock on one wood. of them will turn into a passion. And then that passion could fade and then you look at other interests and you scratch them until you find another one. But to set yourself up that you're going to have this instantaneous first love, first sight, passion, it's too high a bar. It's, it's like saying to your kids, um, you know, you're 18 years old. Why aren't you married yet? 
Uh, you know, you got to do a lot of sampling to get married. Uh, what is your ikigai sense of purpose? Uh, how do you define your purpose? Yeah. And ikigai, by the way, well, ikigai is a Japanese word, and it roughly translates into you know your reason for living, why you get up in your mo in the morning. And I think it, you know, it's pretty close to your passion. Um, and so, yeah, it's this Japanese concept, and it's often, uh, I think, a good example of. Ikigai is when you look at people, there's a lot of specials on YouTube. You know, search for just Japanese living treasures because the Japanese have this concept of living treasures. And I think there's about 50 or 60 in Japan at any given moment. And the typical living treasure is like some 80 year old person. And this guy or this woman is like the best samurai sword maker or the best pottery maker or the best frying pan maker or the best doll maker, or the best, you know, whatever. And you watch what they do, and, you know, the guy making swords, he, he starts with this, like, raw iron ore, and then he's, like, melting it and pounding it and melting it and pounding it and pounding it and pounding it, you know. And it takes just thousands of steps to make this sword. And that guy has that guy found has his ikigai. Found I mean, that's his reason for living. That's his passion and I think you'll be lucky in life if you find that once. But if you're really lucky, you'll, you'll find it more than once. And one of the things that I learned from interviewing people on my podcast from a guy named Mark Manson, he's an author. He said, Guy, you, you will know you're on the right track when what you're doing involves what other people consider a shit sandwich. So I don't know if that's a common term in Turkey, but shit sandwich means that it's something that everybody looks at and say, why are you eating that shit sandwich? That's like a really hard, ugly thing to do. So in podcasting, the shit sandwich is editing. In writing, the shit sandwich is editing. <laughs> Seems to be yes. a common thread here. But from the outside looking the outside. in, you know, when you see a podcaster spend hours editing, hours doing research, you see a writer, a writer spend days, literally. I bet you I have corrected my manuscript. I bet you 10,000 times, 10,000 ch changes that I've made. And from the outside looking in, you think, oh my God, like, what? Well, that makes no sense. Why would you do that? And that's the shit sandwich of writing, but that's what I love to do. So any of you listening out there, like perhaps, perhaps your ikigai is cooking and there's st there's processes in the cooking that most people look at and say, you know, wow, you know, that I'm not willing to do that. That is like so hard, so tedious, so time consuming. That's a shit sandwich. Well, when you enjoy that, that means you found your ikigai. So you 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 tell that your podcast writing is your ikigai and also shit sandwich. <laughs> and uh, when do you start the remarkable people podcast? So it is not a decade away. I think a couple of years earlier. Yeah, I've I've done. I've done my podcast for about five years now. I've had a couple hundred guests. And uh, my podcast truly has remarkable people like Jane Goodall, like uh, Steve Wozniak, Margaret Atwood, Stacey Abrams. I've had two MacArthur Fellows, uh, Angela Duckworth and Stephen Wolfram. So, yeah, I've had very remarkable people. And, and that led to the book because after five years of looking back, I said, oh, guy, you have 200 episodes. That's 200 hours of listening. The transcripts are 20 pages per episode. So it's 4,000 pages. So if people wanted to gain all the wisdom from all your guests, they'd have to listen for 200 hours or read 4,000 pages. So I thought, you know, God, there must be a better way. So working with my co-author, Madison Neismer, we basically distilled 1,000 pages down to 170. So these are the major lessons that we learned from interviewing all these remarkable people. So Think Remarkable, the book, is not the gospel according to Guy. This is Guy's experience and filter addressed to 4,000 pages and 200 hours so that you don't have to go through that. And I'm just giving you, I have filtered out, it, it's like mining diamonds. You know, you have 2,000 tons of dirt to find two carats of diamonds. I found the two carats of diamonds for you. I mean, you often embrace the yes mindset, default yes. And also you mentioned in the uh, Think Remarkable book that some of the remarkable people have their boundaries and say no to many things. Yes. How can we understand when to say yes, when to say Well, 
One of the things about remarkable people is that you can keep two conflicting thoughts in your brain at the same time. So (laughs) you have pointed this out, right? So on the one hand, I'm saying when people bring you opportunities, when, when you have opportunities to do stuff, just say yes, even though you're not sure you can do it. Just say yes and figure it out because that's the growth mentality, right? The fixed mindset mentality would mean, no, 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 no. I've never done this before. I cannot do this. The growth mindset says yes and you try. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is, you know, you focus, you, you put the eggs in your basket and you watch those eggs. You don't go look for more chickens. So those things are in direct opposition. And I, I tell you, on that continuum, I am much more towards default to yes, say yes to everything. Uh, but I tell you something, I say yes to everything. But then when I, when I go deep, I go very deep. I mean, very deep. And so I, th- I think life is, th- there are conflictions, uh, there are conflicts like that, that you, you have to use your judgment. And sometimes you say yes, and sometimes you say no. But I think by saying yes, you can scratch a lot of interests. And then when you find those interests, that's when you start saying no. Like I say no to a lot of things now because I want to say yes to podcasting and writing. Uh, in the book uh, about uh, Christy Yamaguchi, uh, 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 a great example, by the way, of the importance of showing up, practicing consistently. Yes. So um, how do you stay motivated, uh, by the way, uh, day after day, you pursuing a long-term goal, how do you avoid burning out with the... Yeah, well, so the story with Christy Yamaguchi is that when she was very young, in her first competition, she finished something like 12, right? Yeah. So she went to her mom, Carol Yamaguchi, she said, how come the other girls, these three girls got ribbons and I got nothing? And her mom said, that's because you finished 12, honey. If you want a ribbon, you got to finish first, second, or third. And she tells that story. And so Christy Yamaguchi, she started practicing. And she went to practice every day at, I don't know, 6 in the morning. And, she, you know, she had to have a flexible school program because she was practicing so much. And so no, nobody in my book became instantly remarkable and instantly made a difference. You need to sacrifice. It, it just comes with the territory. And... I think you ask, how do you stay motivated? Well, I think much of that answer is that when you find what you love, you don't even think about what motivates you. It's like, you know, honestly, it's not like I sit around saying, what motivates me to write? How can I keep getting motivated? What keeps, you know, what keeps me podcasting? Now, don't get me wrong. There are moments where I say, Oh man, this is too hard. I got to give this up. So everybody has those moments of doubt. And if anybody tells you that they never had a moment of doubt, that they never grew frustrated or tired, I'm telling you right now, they are lying to you. They're lying to you for sure. They may also be lying to themselves. It's just not possible. Everybody has these moments of doubt. So the test is not whether you have these moments of doubt. The test is whether you can push through them and keep going. That's where you get remarkable or not. What do you do in these dope times? Do you go walking? Do you uh, meet with your friends? Are there any shortcuts or hacks that you find useful? I wish I could tell you I just go surfing and it solves everything, but it's not that (laughs) truth. Um, You know, listen, I've been very lucky in my life. And so I think I have... I was somehow given or I grew into a very positive mentality. So I don't have to talk myself out of depressions. I don't get depressed. And what I've learned, you know, I I wish I had this magic formula. When you're, when you're depressed or when you're frustrated, you go for a walk or you go surfing or I don't know, you know, eat mushrooms. I don't know. But for me, for me, uh, I just keep grinding at it. And after a while, you reach the other side of that depression. I just keep grinding. I just keep pushing. I don't, I don't let myself get defeated. It's great uh, insight. Going to, back to Steve Wozniak. <laughs> yeah. Not Steve Jobs, but Steve Wozniak. Yeah. Uh, especially the Silicon Valley embraces the uh, making products for the market, for the people. Uh, do you think that to build the products for personal use or 
uh, for others to use. Yeah. How, how does the product idea comes? So there are multiple paths to success, all right? It, it's not like there's only one way. So the Steve Wozniak way was I'm building an Apple One because I want a computer that's small and cheap and easy to use. I'm building it for myself. And lucky for him, he wasn't the only nerd that wanted that. So that's one method. Another method is that you work backwards from your customers. So you figure out, you know, what's really frustrating your customers? What do they really want? And rather than looking at what I like to do or what I have been doing, I'll work backwards from their needs and fill that need, not forward from what I like to do. Another method is to go and actually see how your customers are, are living and, you know, see how they're using products that are going to compete with you or something. And another theory is you go and be. So, you know, you, you don't just watch people how they do stuff. You actually go and do the stuff to see what frustrations and how things could be made better. Now, going and seeing and going and being well, going and being means you're building for yourself. Going and seeing means you're watching others. And working backwards means you're watching others. So those two things, just like our earlier discussion, those two are conflicting thoughts. I'm telling you again, remarkable people, you can hold conflicting thoughts in your brain. You know, it's not one or zero, black or white. And so there's multiple paths to success. And, you know, that, that's one of the dangers of reading business books because it's it's always like the last book you read that you start believing in right so you know and often business books are two or three hundred pages to espouse one idea right mm -hmm. i don't know it takes 200 pages to explain how to do one thing um you will find that my book is not like that that my book is 170 pages and we counted, we counted the tactics that we explain in the book. And there's 88. So there's 88 tactics to use to make a difference and be remarkable. And I'll tell you right now, there is internal conflict within those 88. There are some things that say default to yes. There's some things that say focus. And for the fifth time, let me tell you, you got to be able to hold those two things in your head. Another point may be the fake it until you make it. You, you advise people to use this mindset in a couple of uh, uh, videos and also take talks. And could <laughs> you expand on, on this idea? Yeah, well, first, there's, there's two, two words here. Face it and fake it, okay? So fake it till you make it means that you put on an air of confidence and success, which breeds confidence and success. Now, some people have interpreted fake it till you make it to mean that you lie, right? So, and those people are in jail now. And the extreme example of that is Terranos, which is, this is a company that said with a few drops of your blood, we can have all these medical diagnoses and they didn't get their technology to work. So they faked it. They faked the results. I am not saying that. Fake it till you make it is about your personal aura and your personal, like the way you carry yourself, like, you may be scared stiff, but you cannot show fear. That's fake it till you make it, not lie about the test results. That's not, that's lying. Lying till you make it is not what I'm saying. No, the second way, the second F word is face it till you make it. F-A-C-E. And face it till you make it is the concept I learned from a guy named Garrett McNamara. Garrett McNamara is a big wave surfer. And when I say big, I mean 100 feet, 30 meters, 30 meter wave, okay? And his, his recommendation and his thoughts to me was, guy, you know, sometimes you just got to keep facing these dangers. And after a while, these dangers will no longer be scary to you. Now, I'm not saying that if you never surf, you should go face a 100-foot wave. But you start with a 2-foot wave. You go to a 10-foot wave, a 20-foot wave, a 30-foot wave. But you have to face all those dangers. And then one day, you'll be facing a 100-foot wave. So you have to face it until you make it. And that's a second theory. 
how will be fighting the fire using the water or the fire so yeah. can you describe some a situation where you and non confrontate show uh, approach help you overcome some obstacles yeah so you know there's two concepts fight fire with fire or fight fire with water so fight fire with fire means that you know your competitor lo lowers the price so you fight fire with fire you lower the price and it's it's conflict it's you know head to head bashing fight fire with water means that instead of doing head to head fighting you try to put out the other person's fire you know you don't necessarily if the person reduces prices you don't match the price reduction maybe you add features or you know you do something different other than just fighting directly head to head and um i i got to tell you a fighting fire with water is probably better than fighting fire with fire i much of much of where we are today in society i think is because of this male dependency on this concept of we got to show who the tough guy is right and you know in the united states we have people driving to the us mexico border in their pickup trucks with their shotguns ready to like shoot all the invaders and then they get there and like ah where is everybody there's nobody here i mean you know they're, they're trying to fight fire with fire and it, it would be better to fight fire with water which means empathy and caring and you know i mean it's it's hard to bludgeon people into becoming your friend uh, how do you measure success and what does your success mean to you how, uh, how do you personally define success yeah well at this point in my life and i'm 69 i define su su i define success at how much difference i can make in the world and how i can leave the world a better place so when i die i want people to say that i helped them make a difference i made a difference i mean i helped them make a difference with podcasting and writing and speaking and investing and advising and so i think that yeah your life can be divided into three parts the first part of your life you're underpaid the second part of your life you're overpaid and the third part of your life you pay back and i'm in the payback stage who has been the greatest inspiration for you ah uh, well i would have to say that steve jobs has been a huge inspiration for me and now i don't mean that i i want to i i don't want to be like elizabeth teranos uh, not elizabeth i don't want to be like elizabeth holmes you know i'm not trying to do steve jobs impersonation you know, wear the black mock turtleneck and wear jeans and and wear the running shoes and buy a mercedes or a porsche and, you know I, i'm not trying to be steve jobs emulation but i would say he inspired me because of his ability to figure out the products that people wanted before they could articulate them and he he i think he's done that better than almost anybody Um the closest rival is probably Elon Musk but I got to tell you something Elon Musk man I do not get that guy he could have gone down in history as one of the greatest inventors right he he caused the electrification of cars he worked on tunnels and trips to Mars and boring tunnels and you know chip implants and like so many such innovative stuff And I don't know what happened to him but all of a sudden his idea of like you know let's buy Twitter and turn it into a cesspool and let's become this racist nation and I don't know something happened to him I don't know Have you ever feel imposter syndrome and how do you overcome this kind of syndromes what do you I advise that, I think that anybody who is has any even a minimum amount of self consciousness has walked into a room and said You know, look at all these people, they're overqualified compared to me. Why why am I here? I've done that. I I've, I've had that feeling. I can't tell you it's all the time now. I'm 69, so I kind of walk into a room and I say, "Yeah, I could see why I'm here." But believe me, for a long time I walked into rooms and said, "I'm not sure why I'm here." And uh I I think you now there's a fine line here. So there's imposter syndrome. where you question why you're here and do you deserve it I'm a little past that but I tell you something if if one goes much further then you start you start getting into the darkness again and the darkness is that I deserve this right that that I'm entitled to this so 
You go from imposter syndrome to entitlement syndrome. The best thing is you stop in the middle. Don't, you know, you're not questioning whether you deserve it. On the other hand, you're not so far over that you believe you're entitled to it. It's hard to walk that, <laughs> to walk between those two extremes. What is your morning routine look like? What does a typical day look like for you today? Uh, you, you don't have... want to know. So <laughs> I, I swear, as you get old, you just cannot sleep late. I cannot sleep late. I wish I could sleep late. So, you know, okay, I, I swear, I get up around 4, 4.30, and, like, my mind is going a 1,000 miles an hour. So I know this is wrong, so I want you to not do what I'm about to tell you. So my phone is charging right by my head. So I pick up my phone, and I start going through Google News. And I read about <laughs> all the Google News and, you know, what's happening all over the world and, you know, How's all the lawsuits going against Donald Trump and all that? And then I, I spend an hour reading news. And then if I'm lucky, I fall back asleep. If I'm not lucky, I get up and I, I start checking email and I start writing and I start working on my podcast. So I work a long day. I love to work. What does your breakfast look like nowadays? Okay, my, bre nutrition. Very consistent. my breakfast is one slice of whole wheat toast with peanut oh. butter. Half a banana with one cup of coffee with milk. That's it. Almost every day, that's my breakfast. And um, what I've done is I figured out that slice of wheat toast is about 75 calories. Half a banana is about 75 calories. The milk in the coffee, let's call that, you know, 50 calories. So my breakfast is 200 calories. Um, man, if I... It, If I could eat that three meals a day, I would lose a lot of weight. But then nah, that's, that's, and you know what? It, it's like, I, I actually think that when you have a, a practice where you eat the same damn thing every morning, it, from the outside looking in, you say, man, that's so boring. Like, God, don't you want to change your pace? And it's kind of the same way. I, I love this clothing brand called Scotty Vest. And with Scotty Vest, They have this black mock turtleneck and a gray mock turtleneck. And I don't have one on today, but almost every day I wear one of those. And so, you know, so from the outside looking, you say, guy, you're such a boring person. You wake up, you eat the same peanut butter and banana sandwich. You wear the same shirt. What's up with that? And I'll tell you something. What's up with that is I don't care how I dress. I don't care how I eat. I'm not a foodie. This is just two things less to think about. And instead, I'm thinking about how I'm going to be a great guest for this guy from Turkey. You know, that's more important than what shall I wear today? What should I eat today? I need to be good on this podcast. That's more important. So I thank you, you very much. You know, right yeah. before we started this podcast, I sent you an email saying, can we start 15 minutes later? That's because I was making my peanut butter toast. So do you have any regrets or major regrets that you? And uh, how they shape your person. You know, listen, it, it, I, I'm not trying to say that I've lived a perfect life because I'm so freaking smart. I did everything right. Okay. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, as you look back on your life, as Steve Jobs would say, that's when you can connect the dots. And so I don't look back on my life and say, oh my God, you know, I should have stayed in law school. My life would have been better because that's not true. I have very few regrets in my life because when I had interests, I pursued them. And so I scratched all those itches. And now I could look back and say, you know, guy, you quit Apple twice and then you turned Steve Jobs down when he offered you a third job. So I left Apple or declined Apple declined three Apple times. Three If I had said yes, said yes, any of those three times, I would be much richer today. But I would also be an asshole. So, you know, it, it, there's pluses and minuses. Now, I, in my book, I cite the work of Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink had something called the Regrets Project, where he let people uh, all over the world answer, you know, what are their regrets in life. And he found out that there were two major regrets that's across all societies, which is that they didn't seize the day and try something new. They didn't, you know, go for it. They played it safe is one regret. And the other regret is that they let their family and friends, those relationships lapse. 
and they shouldn't have. So the, the, I think that that's think, what people yeah. need to be conscious of, that you're more likely to look back and say, God, I should have, I should have tried that. I should have, when I was, when I was interested in art and I thought I was an artist, but I, I subordinated that desire to play it safe. You're going to look back and say, oh, God, I wish I tried. I wish I tried to be an artist. There's so many insightful stories and heartwarming wisdom across 200 pages. What's the key uh, overarching lesson or inspiration you most want readers to take away from the Think Remarkable? I want you to take away. First of all, this book is very tactical and practical, okay? I mean, you're not going to find anything in that book. That you say, oh, well, duh. I mean, you know, that's such a high-level recommendation. Um, this is all tactics and practicals. So I, I, the overarching message is in order to be remarkable, it's not because you decide to be remarkable. It's because you have done something good. You've made a difference. Now, you don't have to be Steve Jobs and sell millions of computers or Jane Goodall. You just need to make a difference. It could be one person. could be your own self. It could be a classroom, a team. It could be, you know, a side of the hill that you help repopulate with native species. It could be anything like that. It could be you had the world's best coffee shop in, in Istanbul, right? And so when you make a difference, what happens is you make a difference and then people will think that you're remarkable. It's not because you decided to be remarkable one day. Right. That's bullshit. Steve Jobs didn't spend any time wondering how he can position himself as remarkable. He did remarkable things. And guess what? That's why we all think he's remarkable. So the overarching message of this book is here are 88 ways to make a difference. And if you do these, you're going to be remarkable. What legacy do you aim to live or what would you like to be well, remembered? Well, when I, when I, as I said, when I die, I, I just want to be remembered as someone who helped people make a difference, that I was a catalyst. I helped them make a difference. Not that I, not that I became a billionaire hedge fund manager and I donated a building to Stanford, right? That's not, I don't want to be, well, I'm not a billionaire and I'm not donating any buildings to Stanford. So if I donate anything, it's going to be to community colleges and state colleges and people who are helping, you know, not the not the Ivy League kind of student. I, I want to help the rest of the people. And um, so that's what I want to be remembered for, empowering people. Two words, empower people. Guy, mahalo. <laughs> it was, that's a Turkish word. Mahalo is, I think, uh, thank you uh, in yes. Hawaiian. Yes, uh, so, yes. Uh, it was uh, such an honor and privilege to have you on, on the podcast. And thank you for uh, sharing and generously sharing the Remarkable oh. wisdom stories with me. Thank you all very right. much. It was my pleasure and thank you for having me. And I hope all of you listening have a chance to read the book. I promise you, it'll help you make a difference. So, all right. All the best to you. Thank you, guy. Okay.